Good morning, Loft. It is so good to see you here this morning. I am glad that we got an extra hour last night because there was a lot of crazy sports that happened. Some of you needed the extra hour to celebrate and sleep in, and some of us needed the extra hour to grieve and mourn their team's loss. And so I would just appreciate it if you could respect my prophecy during this difficult time. I'm, I'm not used to losing, and it's just... It's, it's terrible, it's terrible, but I'm so glad that you are here today. And I know that I have uh, told you before that when I was 17, I competed in the Miss Teen USA pageant as Miss Alabama Teen USA. And as part of the competition, I traveled to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where I competed in a variety of preliminary events. <laughs> I was judged in interview, and I was judged in swimsuit, and I was judged in evening gown. And you have to remember that I am from a very small town in South Alabama that has one red light, and I was competing against some very glamorous teenage girls. You're probably not surprised to know that Texas won the year that I competed. Texas won again this year. Texas wins a lot. But the judges, they were extremely intimidating. On the judges panel was an actor named Chris Cooper and Dr. Joyce Brothers. And so during interview, just trying to have conversation as a 17-year-old girl from Alabama <laughs> did not go well. And then the intensity of just everything about who you are and what you look like being judged. And then... On the final night of competition, broadcast on CBS for everyone to see, when you announced yourself from your state, your judgment or your preliminary score that you received from the judges flashed on the screen. So what number did I, the judges give me? The judges gave me an 8.7, which put me firmly in the bottom of the pack. Now, I felt really vulnerable. I felt scrutinized. I felt even embarrassed because when I came back from competing, the high school kids at my school had plastered 8.7 all over my locker. And that 8.7 still lives on Wikipedia today. Now, if you have ever been judged, if you have ever tried out for a sport, or tried out for cheerleading or had some kind of competition in which you were judged. I mean, we are in Texas, so it's possible that like you had your cow judged or like your pig judged at some point. You know how uncomfortable being judged can be. Judgment is not a pleasant or popular topic, which is why I think Daniel asked me to preach on it today. We have been in a series called Heaven, Hell, and Everything in Between, and Daniel has done a fantastic job over the last few weeks of talking about our internal wiring for eternity and unpacking heaven and hell, and today we have arrived at the in-between. We are talking about divine judgment. Now, when it comes to God's judgment, it can bring a variety of reactions and emotions. I am already starting to sweat as I bring this message, and I'm sure at some point you might even squirm in your seats. But there are usually two polarizing camps when it comes to the topic of God's judgment. In one camp, there are people who love to talk about God's judgment. They look for judgment day. They look for signs of judgment day. They declare judgment day is coming. They declare judgment on others about their behaviors or their activities. And they love the idea of people getting what they deserve. And then in the other camp, there are people who want nothing to do with the idea of God's judgment. And instead, they shy away from it and favor a God who is just all grace and all mercy and all love and all compassion and even acceptance. And it can be hard to reconcile the tension between what we understand about judgment in terms of maybe vengeance or retribution or harsh disposition with the same God who we know to be a God of love, mercy, and grace. But judgment 
is the way that God carries out justice. And when it comes to God's justice, there can be a lot of questions. I mean, their question that's probably most commonly asked is, if a God is good, how can he judge? How can a good God be one who judges and carries out justice? And I read a story which I think helps us address that perspective a little bit. In a novel by the British mystery writer P.D. James, a detective says, I don't go for all this emphasis on sin and suffering and judgment. If I had a God, I'd like him to be intelligent and cheerful and amusing. And in response, her Jewish colleague says, I doubt whether you would find him much of a comfort when they herded you into the gas chamber. You might prefer a God of vengeance. So just judgment carries out God's justice, and justice is a necessary part of God's goodness. So you think about it, we wouldn't say that a person is good if they were indifferent about evil or they turned a blind eye to suffering. So justice is a necessary part of the goodness of God. For God to be good, he must be just. And for God to be just, he must judge. So what do we mean when we say divine judgment? So I put forth a definition for you today that I found helpful from John R. Colson, who wrote a book called The Righteous Judgment of God. He says, God's judgment is his evaluation of people, his assessment of their character and conduct against a standard of righteousness that he has set and given to humans. And now the Bible has a lot to say about judgment. We could probably be here hours trying to cover all the different types of judgment that we see in scripture. But since we don't all want to do that today, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to talk about three types of judgment that we see in the Bible that I think are helpful for understanding divine judgment and the implications that it has on our relationship with God. So the first type of judgment is this, the judgment of humanity. So in Genesis chapter two, verse 16 and 17, it tells us, and the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Now there is nothing unfair or deceptive about this command. It is a very clear expectation from the creator, yet it doesn't take very long for the first human couple to disobey God. And just one chapter later, it tells us when the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of them were both open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. So God had declared beforehand that the consequence of disobedience would be death. And God kept his word and he issued judgment on Adam and Eve and the serpent. And death came into the world for the first time. And this type of death is an alienation from God. It's the death of freedom and innocence and lack of shame, and it's a death that affected everything about their lives, their relationship with God and each other and themselves and creation. And this fall or this type of death in Christian theology, it is known as the fall. And what it tells us in the Bible is that this death will affect the descendants of Adam and Eve, which means it affects us today. Now, I grew up in the church, but I left the church at 18, and I was done with God, faith, Jesus, Christians, all of it, completely rejected religion altogether. And the years that I spent away from faith before I gave my life to Jesus in my 20s, I would probably best describe myself as agnostic. I believed in a God or that there was a God or or gods, but I just wasn't really a fan of this one. And one of my biggest hangups, which I've now come to learn is not that uncommon, 
is this idea that my life could be affected by a choice or decision that two people made in a garden thousands of years ago. I just could not reconcile that. And I didn't really believe that sin was real because if sin is falling short of God and God sets the standard for sin and I didn't really consider God to be authority in my life, then sin didn't really affect or matter to me anyway. So I just lived my life however I wanted to live my life. There was really no determining factor for right or wrong, what was in bounds or out of bounds, the choices that I made. I just did whatever I felt like or whatever I wanted to. And it did not go well for me. And as I moved into my 20s, things grew increasingly hard and destructive around me. I was in a friend group. We partied a lot. I had one friend who committed suicide. I saw another one overdose. And it was becoming increasingly hard to deny that when I looked around at my friends, the destruction of my life, the brokenness of my relationships, my family, it was hard to deny that something wasn't right. And then I had this increasingly growing awareness of myself, of the choices I had made, of my behaviors, of the consequences of those things, of how angry I was, how prideful I was, the hurt that I carried around all the time. And it became impossible at my lowest to deny that I was just like Adam and Eve. I had rebelled against God in the same way, that sin very much was real and had affected my life. And I remember at my lowest point, I found myself on the ground of an apartment complex, crying about the hopelessness of how my life felt, that it was just too much, that there was no way that I could continue in this way. And so I prayed earnestly to God for the first time in my life. And I said, God, if you are real, I need you. I need you to save me. I need you to help me. Because there was something inside of me that realized that I could not do this on my own. And when I reached out and cried out to God, he answered and he rescued me and he gave me grace. And that's the thing that we see about judgment in scripture is that judgment always comes with grace. So the way that God responded to Adam and Eve in the garden, he puts into motion a plan of redemption and hope. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In this verse, God is describing his redemptive plan to crush the serpent and to redeem humanity. And there's this tenderness in the way that he unfolds his plan because in Genesis 3, it is the actions of Eve that put into motion the fall. But when he talks about his plan of redemption in Genesis 3, he says it will come through a woman. And God's grace, it's a way that he operates and that he deals with human sin and it's the way that he restores people back to himself. And the thing that we see in the Old Testament is that scripture is that judgment and grace, they coexist. That is the story in Genesis, and that is the story of God's people throughout the Old Testament, that judgment comes with grace. But ultimately, the solution for sin and judgment lies beyond the Old Testament. So the first type of judgment is the judgment of humanity known as the fall. The second type is this, judgment on the cross. So the Old Testament opens with a story about John the Baptist, and we are immediately confronted with the topic of judgment. John spoke of the coming Messiah in Matthew chapter 3. He says, his winnowing fork in his hand, he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So John declares that the one to come after him, the Messiah, will come with a winnowing fork in his hand. 
Now, do I have any personal experience with a winnowing fork? Why no? No, I don't. But here is what I have learned about a winnowing fork. It is used to separate the good part of the grain from the husk or the chaff, which is not unused, which is not usable. So they would take this window and fork and they would throw the wheat in the air and then the breeze would come and blow away the husk known as the chaff and the good grain would fall to the floor. Now this seems like a very labor intensive process. And I also don't know what they do if the wind's not blowing that day. It seems like it would be highly problematic to the harvesting process. The closest thing that I have in my experience with this is that I grew up at my grandmother's shucking corn. And if you have ever had to shuck a lot of corn, you know that it is a labor intensive process. And did y'all know that sometimes you can peel back that husk and there are worms inside of there? Yes. Okay. Some other people have, this is why to this day, I only buy pre-shucked corn. Thank you, H-E-B. But what John is trying to get at with this metaphor is he's saying that the grain represents those who repent of their sins and trust in Christ. And the chaff, the unusable part, that those are the people who reject the Messiah. And what will happen to the chaff for those who reject Messiah is that they will burn in an unquenchable fire, which is mentioned in the Old Testament by the prophets. Now, no one has ever accused John the Baptist of being soft on judgment. But then Jesus comes, and Jesus has a lot to say about judgment. Jesus talks about the judgment of Israel and the nations. He talks about his final role in judgment. And he also talks about the judgment of the world and the defeat of Satan that will occur with his death on the cross. So in John chapter 12, Jesus says, Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. So these words come as Jesus is speaking to a group in Jerusalem, and the topic of discussion is Jesus' impending death, the plan and purpose for which he had come. And he's talking about his ultimate sacrifice on the cross that would lead to the judgment of sin in the world and the defeat of evil forever. And when Jesus hangs on the cross, Mark 15, verse 33 tells us, at noon, darkness came over the whole land until three. And this darkness was predicted by the Old Testament prophets because this darkness is a symbol of God's judgment. So on Friday morning, I was working on this sermon really early in the morning. I was all writing about darkness and God's judgment. And then I woke my kids up to take them to school. We're getting ready, we're doing our routine, things are crazy, and then all of a sudden, like with a zapping noise, all the power goes out. And it is dark outside, which makes it terribly dark inside of our house. I mean, pitch black. So one child up in upstairs screams in terror for someone to come get him. The other one goes out the front door to see if everyone else's lights are off too. And there were, there were like 12,000 of us without power Friday morning. And it was so dark and we're looking for flashlights and I'm trying to get them in the car. And one of my 13 year olds says, I think it's the beginning of the apocalypse. (laughs) And then I said, and what I thought was my best preacherly, pastoral authority, no, son, it is a sign of God's judgment. And they both said, Mom, you're so lame. You make everything about the Bible. Uh, You're so lame. I thought it was a great joke. I mean, we were in the dark. God's judgment, they are not appreciated at all. So the darkness at Calvary that day, as Jesus hangs there, speaks of God's judgment of all humanity now falling on Jesus. It says, later knowing that everything now had been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when they had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. And this declaration 
on the part of Jesus meant that everything that he had come from heaven to earth to accomplish was done. It meant that everything that was needed for the full revelation of the character of God had been accomplished. It meant that everything that was needed under the law for sinners to be saved had been performed. And the final price of redemption had been paid. It was finished then, it is finished now, and it will always be finished. And because of his act on the cross, that means when you die, the immediate judgment is either saved or unsaved, believer or unbeliever. And I want you to make sure that you hear this because this judgment is not based on works. This judgment is based on faith. It will not matter how many good things that you have done, how much of the Bible you have read, how many doors you are opened, how many things you have done that are good. What will matter is whether or not you have repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus because Jesus bore our judgment on the cross so that we would not have to. Judgment and grace existed together on the cross. So the first type of judgment is a judgment of humanity. The second type of judgment is judgment on the cross. And the third type is this, the final judgment. So when we use the term final judgment, we are talking about the last judgment that will come at the end of this present age. Now, what is that for debate and what people like to debate is when the final judgment actually happens. Daniel is going to preach on the end times next week. He'll talk more about that. But what is an agreement that I'm talking about today is that there is a final judgment. That is something we can agree on. And what we know or understand about final judgment largely comes from the writings of Apostle Paul. Now, Paul wrote a lot about final judgment. And if you think we have a hard time with the doctrine of judgment today, we are not unlike the people of Paul's day because Greek and Roman religion and philosophy had no doctrine of final judgment. It was unique to Judaism. So he explained it a lot. And he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us, the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So if you were to travel to Corinth on the days of Paul, you could make your way towards the center of town, you could climb up a little bit, and you would find yourself into something known as the Forum. And in the Forum, you would be surrounded by shops and temples and public buildings. And in those public buildings, you would find a government headquarters. And there in the middle, in Paul's day, is where the Roman governor sat and dispensed justice. It was called the judgment seat. And so in modern times, we often like declare judgment behind closed doors. It's rare that most of us find ourselves in a courtroom. We certainly see some on TV. We've seen lots of fictional courtrooms, but it was not like that in the ancient days. Justice was very public and everyone knew about it. And so this picture that Paul is trying to create for us is that one day we will all sort of go to the center of town, so to speak, and we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will make an account for our lives. And this judgment will be about the good things that we have done and we will be rewarded for those good things. Now, I know that all of us, We all pray and we have heart's desires that one day when we stand there before the Lord that we will be found faithful of living our lives in a way that pleases Christ. And I think that sometimes we can miss why Paul wrote so much about final judgment because in his day, there was this line of thinking, which I think exists still today, 
that if I am saved, does it really matter how I live my life? And Paul would say, yes, yes, it does. Because it's not an issue of salvation and condemnation. It is the extent for which we are living for him and making God the priority of our life. So when it comes to final judgment, the question we must take seriously today is this. To what extent am I living my life influenced by the truth that one day I will stand before the judgment seat of the Lord and make an account for my life. Because Paul thought that the knowledge of what is coming should affect our present. Because Paul wants us to remember that yes, yes, we are saved. We are saved from. We are saved from ourselves. We are saved from sin. We are saved from death. We are saved from hell. But not only are we saved from, we are saved for. We are saved for a life of love and grace and mercy. We are saved for a life that faithfully lives in acts of service and makes a difference in the lives and the world and people around us. We are saved for sharing the good news that we have and the hope of the gospel with other people. We are saved for a relationship God for God, which where we love him with all of who we are and all that we have. And we are saved for a life that lives in such a way that it would honor God. And there is no doubt that along the way, as we walk this out faithfully towards the end of our time, that we will mess up that we will get it wrong, that we will fail, that we will need to repent often, sometimes daily. But there will always be grace for us as we live our lives to please God. And the beauty of the gospel is this, that judgment always comes with grace. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that we do not have to fear the day that is coming, that we don't have to see you as a God who is out to get us or who is angry or who's just waiting on us to fail, God, but that we can see you as a God of, yes, God, a way that you have for us to flourish in life that gives us boundaries and expectations and ways that are good for us, God, but also a God of grace who extends his hand when we fall and when we fail and gives us forgiveness when we ask and empowers us to live our lives in a way that honor and please him. God, I pray right now for anyone that's here who is wrestling with the things of faith in the same way that I wrestled all those years ago. God, I pray that you would call them to you God, that you would extend the redemption and grace and mercy to them. And if that's you right now, all you have to do is say, God, I don't wanna do this on my own anymore. I confess my sins and I put my life and my faith and my trust in you as my savior. God, I pray that we would be a people who live our lives in such a way that we bring honor and glory to you. God, that we would be a people who gets there before you one day and gets to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. We thank you for giving everything for us on the cross and that through Jesus's death, we can live a life of wholeness and freedom and healing and power. And it's in his name we pray today, amen.